And so um, what did I learn? If you have a good idea, don't give it up too easily, but listen hard to others. They usually have some good additional suggestions and reevaluate and be realistic. And if it still seems good, be stubborn. It's a real um, pleasure and a privilege to be here in a room with you all because I really think that following up on what Zave said, these are, you know, looking to your left and your right, you are gems, definitely. And, um, and also you're not too shabby at all. <laughs> but also, you know, it is the innovation and it is everybody here is thinking and being outside of the box. And um, so I think it's a real privilege to be here and it is also a huge privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Fraser, who is one of my personal heroes, as well as, um, as I've said, a hidden gem. So I've got my official introduction and then I've got my unofficial introduction, which Gary doesn't know about yet. <laughs> but um, to start with, yes, so he's Professor of Medicine and Professor of Epidemiology in Loma Linda. Um, and he was born in Christchurch, went to the University of Otago Medical School. <laughs> and then on top of that, went on to get degrees and PhD in epidemiology and then also mathematics, statistics. So that, stri that striving for excellence and that grit is something which has really characterised a lot of the, um, his journey along the way. Um, there has been over $30 million in grants, which he has got money from the NIH, huge research teams, which he's led, huge grants, which he's um, gained over 210 publications as well. So he's really one of the, you know, when we were talking about standing on the shoulders of greats, I know that a lot of the medical community and a lot of everybody who is really looking at how to empower ourselves, our children and um, our communities to um, be responsible for our own health and to live healthy lifestyles. Um, a lot of the research from that has come from the Adventist health studies um, and from Dr. Fraser's work in that. So that's a very brief overview. I know that you'll be able to talk a lot more about, about your story, which is really quite phenomenal. And I also um, want to recognise Sharon, because be, beside each great person, there is always the people who motivate us and who inspire us as well. And so it's a real pleasure to have her here as well. She's another Kiwi gem, but I know she doesn't want me to talk too much about her. So go and meet her. She's sitting right next to Gary. Um, the unofficial part is that when you think about innovation, when you think about health, and when you think about humility, all of these things, three things are embodied in, in Dr. Fraser. That um, exactly this concept of that Kiwis can fly, that you think outside the box, you believe, you pick yourself up when you have failure after failure potentially, you um, really have a goal and you have an idea and you want to do the best, not just for yourself, but for the next generation. And this concept of service. Nobody really embodies this better than Dr. Fraser, who still works as um, one of the heads of cardiology at the hospital, as well as um, living and working part-time in New Zealand. Because, you know, with all of the wonderful technology that we've heard about, you can, you can work remotely with a research team as well. Also, with health, it's something which is really something that has underpinned a lot of the conversations. And um, Rod did an amazing job this morning of, of highlighting the importance of passing it on to the next generation and of also finding our um, true north and taking responsibility for our own health. And the good Kiwi grit. And I am going to really leave it with that um, and invite you to share with me in the next 20 minutes and to welcome Dr. Fraser to the stage. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much, Marguerite. How can I possibly live up to that? I <laughs> actually feel like um, any one of the others of you could probably do as well as I could and, uh, and uh, achieve some of the things that um, you know, maybe I have uh, done, maybe I haven't. But uh, certainly it's very good to be here in the company of uh, so many Kiwis. Um, most of you, I'm sure, have been living the same experiences that we have uh, uh, in wonder at American craziness in one moment and uh, the next moment grateful for the opportunities and the friendship that we uh, get from them. Uh, Aotearoa is a great country. This is a great country too, despite the current politics and all. But, um, you know, so... So, um, I'm an old guy, uh, we've been here for 42 years, uh, it doesn't seem nearly that long. I arrived in 1977, Sharon a little later. Our family arrived with kids aged 10 and 13 in, uh, from a South Pacific summer in January to a Minnesota January, and um, it was a, uh, an interesting uh, experience. We. Uh, had you know really thought we'd gone to Mars for a while, but Minnesota we really came to love and, and enjoy. Um, I, I'm possibly you know a different generation to some of you. The New Zealand that I left is not the New Zealand that we keep going back to, although it's still a very wonderful place. Uh, the first Prime Minister that I can actually remember was Sid Holland, although I think Peter Fraser was when I was born, the, I can't remember him, he's not a relative. Um, then Walter Nash came into play somewhere or other, and then there was uh, Keith Holyoke that we actually became connected to by, by marriage. Uh, um, my uncle married uh, his niece, I think, I never met him. So um, it's been a while, I can actually remember the Wharfie strike in 1951, I was a little kid. Um, but my dad worked for the Sanitarium Health Food Company and um, he, he used to promote and deliver wheat bix And the wheat bix was all made in Christchurch. And the question was, how in the world would the parliamentarians get wheat bix you know, uh, across the strait when the wharfies wouldn't unload it at the wharf and how would parliament function and so forth? So I can remember helping him unload fishing boats that they'd arranged to take the wheat bix from Picton to... Uh, was it Lyle Bay or somewhere or other uh, up there? And um, no, no one ever considered that the parliaments, parliamentarians might have been better off without it. That wasn't something that was entertained much. Um, so where, where did I come from? Probably about the same place as most of you. My parents were good, solid folks. They were uh, Seventh-day Adventists, which was not so common back, back in New Zealand. Um, uh, and my parents, um, uh, sorry, my, my, uh, I did high school because my dad moved around quite a lot in his job, uh, partly at Papua Nui High School in Christchurch, then I went to Rongatai College in Wellington for a little bit, around the time the airport was opened actually, it was quite an exciting time. Then um, Central Hawke's Bay College in Waipakarau, you might wonder how I ended up there, that was fun. And then I was very lucky to uh, end up in uh, Mount Albert Grammar School, um, right at the end in Auckland. And um, uh, that, that was good in another way. Oh, I'd got a fairly good school cert mark, and so even though we lived out of area, the MAGS uh, people allowed me to come, and that meant my parents had to buy me a Vespa motor scooter, and that was a big deal, and had a good time. Um, and uh, in seventh form, I, I actually uh, was fortunate enough to get a junior uh, scholarship. And um, despite the fact that I got 93 out of 200, 200 for English, and I've never quite understood that. But 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 uh, <laughs> perhaps there was a good reason. But but you know, fortunately, I, I got the second highest mark in biology in the country and did pretty well in some of the sciences and math. And so I guess it all averaged out. And I mentioned the biology because the very next year, 1964 it was, was a medical intermediate for me. And I don't know how things are now, but at that time you had to take zoology and chemistry and physics for one year, which I took at uh, Auckland University, and based on that, about one person and eight who applied got into medical school. So it was kind of a big deal and um, not too easy. And the uh, first week at class at the University of Auckland doing zoology, 
which you know I should have been pretty good at, you would think. But I knew I was done for because um, half of the grade depended on um, your laboratory and kind of drawing your dissections and so forth. And I can't draw to save my life. I'm sorry, you artistic people. And you know, drawing a cockroach dissection looked like nothing, nothing vaguely biological, letting anything else. And so. Um, I, I realised there was a problem, and I, I planned for this a bit, and yeah, I only got a B- in zoology, but uh, fortunately, because um, I knew there was a problem, I got an A plus in physics and an A in chemistry, and all, all was well, and fortunately. So one of the things I'd just like to mention, and I'm going to kind of go this way, talk a little bit about my experiences, not only here, but also back home, and things that... I've kind of learnt along the way that may be irrelevant to you, I don't know, but it's very important, I think, to realise your limitations in a particular situation and to plan around it. It's not the end of the world if you can't draw, although it seemed pretty close there for a while. But And in fact, the year before, I had um, impressively failed my ATCL exam on the piano. Um, I still love the piano and the pipe organ because um, I had um, just attempted too much. That was scholarship year and it turned out the exam for ATCL and SCOL were only, I don't know, a week or so apart, which was, you know, crazy. And so I learnt very hard uh, to be realistic in a hard way, that um, one has to be realistic about your own schools and what you can realistically take on. And the next year was okay because the university exams ended sufficiently before the ATCL and uh, it all worked out. So the first year in medical school, at that time it was only uh, in Dunedin, Otago was the only medical school, and uh, so we made our trip down there, which was uh, interesting. And everyone was as poor as church mice, you know, a lot of the students and the medical students. And one of the uh, things that fairly quickly became known is that the Otago Daily Times made very good toilet paper. I mean, toilet paper was quite, quite an expensive item. Uh, and, um, but what took a little while to sink into everyone's consciousness was that the print was very water-soluble on the toilet paper with kind of interesting results. So I, I, but, uh, uh, and <laughs> but it turned out the uh, next year the word got around, apparently the newspaper had changed its printing process and things were much improved, but um, anyhow. So the next year after that was 1966, and, and that actually was a year that changed the whole trajectory of my career. And uh, let me tell you how. So this was actually third year in medicine. In the second year of medicine, we had had 10 obligatory lectures in mathematical statistics. And uh, most of my class, of course, were not that way inclined, and this was uh, lectures to be avoided if you possibly could. For me, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I'd never heard of stuff so so amazing. And so the next year, it turned out that our main exams in medicine were in the middle of the year. And um, moreover, it was my opinion that we were spending just far, far too much time in the bod room, the body room dissecting corpses, uh, which was a big deal for the Dean of Medicine at that time, Dr. Adams. And so I got permission to take uh, stage two mathematical statistics uh, along with the medical staff. And uh, later actually um, completed a postgraduate qualification in uh, mathematical statistics. I must say at the time, I was asking myself and my friends were asking me, you know, what in the world was I doing? This was kind of craziness to be, uh, I mean, medicine was tough enough. But um, it turned out that uh, it was a very important thing to do because later on I found that after I graduated that I did love clinical medicine and yet I loved uh, math and stats as well. And so how do you combine those two things? The answer is obvious epidemiology, you see. And so that's really what led to my course. It, uh, I could never have pursued the career I've had without that crazy course of action I took in year three of medicine. And in one way, in a more general way, it gave me a second major strength. 
And I think there's real power for most people if you can think that way, because it, particularly if they have an intersection, because it makes you have an unusual combination. And we live in a very competitive world. And uh, this can sometimes be uh, exceedingly useful. So then back to the US in that uh, frigid winter of 1977, where I had uh, an MBCHB. By the way, I do not have an MD. Um, somehow that got on that slide. Um, um, and um, anyhow, so I had an MBCHB, I had a nearly PhD, I had got my medical specialist qualification and um, got involved in a couple of research grant applications at the University of Minnesota just as a postdoctoral fellow. And at that point I realised that um, Americans were different in ways that I'd never anticipated. And, you know, we all know about the tall poppy syndrome, I guess, because most of us suffer from it. And actually, it's not a bad thing, I think. In fact, in, back in New Zealand, I think that if you ignore that and try and step out of it, you're often considered boorish or stuck on yourself or even perhaps mildly disgusting, I, I, I think. But, um, but Americans, on the other hand, believe that if you're good at something, why ever not? let people know and not to be boastful about it and there's kind of a fine line that to be drawn that is actually quite difficult to to maneuver around and here there's a little anecdote about my wife that I'd like to give because she's um, a, a skilled academic in her own right and practitioner she's got a master's in speech pathology and a master's in uh, clinical and biomedical ethics and um uh, she worked as a speech pathologist, working with fragile kids and adults uh, in the uh, hospital. And uh, there came a time that uh, I'd gotten a research fellowship to, that we were going to take at Cambridge University in England for a year. And so we were back in New Zealand just before we uh, left for Cambridge, and Sharon decided that she really would like to continue her work in speech pathology at maybe the main hospital in Cambridge, which was uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital. And she was talking to a friend, and um, they were talking about how she might con her, sell herself there and hopefully get a reasonable job for a year. And... Um, and she was stating how that she could plan to talk about her excellent skills in um, uh, swallowing disorders and aphasia management and stroke rehab and how that she really had excellent skills in a lot of these areas. And her friend kind of looked a little askance there for a moment and she said, really, Sharon, I think that quite good would be perfectly adequate, you know. Uh, and in the granting environment that many of us face, I imagine some of you, in other words, raising money in this country, uh, I think that we often have, and I do, I know, a little difficulty in knowing just how to frame a biography in such a way that describes our skills and experience and why we are the most amazing choice that could be uh, considered uh, for, the, for some kind of award. Um, so this, I think, raises another and somewhat related issue, and that is that Americans negotiate differently, I think. Um, you know, in New Zealand, when we're talking about people and feel that they need a little direction and so forth, we are very much prone to kind of tell it like it is, I think, and people are helped most to hear the error of their ways very clearly. And... Um, I think Australians are even more so in that direction, though, I think. But, <laughs> but um, uh, it doesn't work so well here. Um, during my first couple of years as a young guy in the cardiology department here, I was taken aside by the chief of cardiology a couple of times and told to call it a little bit that, you know, I was being a little... Uh, um, obnoxious almost at, at times. In fact, there was one of my senior colleagues... Um, who, uh, when we were walking down a hallway together, would keep his face to the opposite wall when he passed me and wouldn't talk. And I was a bit surprised by this because I'd always consider myself a fairly affable guy, you know, and wondering what was going on. But I hadn't been sufficiently respectful. Americans are brought up to believe that they're important people. You know, child raising here is very different 
at least to what it used to be in New, in New Zealand when I grew up. I think it's maybe changed a little bit. But cardiologists particularly believe that they're a pretty important people. And so you've got to be a little cautious about um, how you address things. And I think the Brits are better at some of this than us. Uh, but by the time they've finished their conversation at you, not only do you know that you're wrong, but you know that you're irretrievably stupid. But well, no, all, all in good humour, of course. But um, yeah. <laughs> so the Americans are, are much nicer in this way. While they gently disagree, at the same time, they make it clear that they appreciate you and that your ideas are always worth listening to. But there may be another perspective, you know, I might be wrong, but. And so I think that Kiwis in the US have also got to learn a little bit to stroke while you disagree. And that's something that I had a pretty hard time learning for quite a while. So on to the uh, opportunity that kept me here in the US. When I came in 1977, I had really no thoughts that I would in the US for more than a couple of years. In fact, we dragged out young teenage kids all around the country because we thought it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Washington DC and Glacier National Park and all this. They'll still tell you about the difficulties they experienced on those trips. But um, the opportunity that kept me here really had to do with the religion that I was brought up with. And um, it turned out, as uh, Marguerite already mentioned, that uh, Loma Linda University, I don't know whether you know, but it's an Adventist institution in the sense that the Board of Trustees are nearly all Adventists, but in terms of students and staff, there's a whole lot of non-Adventist people. But of course, we have a certain intro into a large population here. And there are about a million Adventists in the US. I think there's only about 17,000 or so in the New, New Zealand. So um, there was the possibility as an epidemiologist of doing some interesting work. And the thing about Adventists that makes them so useful as a research population is the fact that there is a huge variation in dietary habits. And uh, Adventists are kind of advised to be vegetarian, but it's not required. And it's that not required that makes all the difference, because only about half of them are. And it means that you've then got this population of people who don't smoke, generally they don't drink, have a moderately conservative lifestyle, but these huge differences in dietary habits from some are vegans, some are lacto-vegetarians, some are pesco-vegetarians, eat some fish, and about half of them are non-vegetarians, although they tend to be low meat. So it's kind of like a natural experiment, experiment, and it really couldn't be duplicated anywhere else in the world. So... I've, I guess I had opportunities to go back to New Zealand two or three times and I thought pretty hard about it and decided that it was uh, worth staying here. Um, when I arrived, there was already a large epidemiologic experiment or study, somewhat of the sort going on, but just Adventist in California that was already getting to be a fairly well-known study. And in 1987, when I'd only been here for about eight years, the principal investigator of that study um, quite unpredictably was killed in a sailplane accident. And I was still a pretty young guy, but uh, then they, the university came to me and uh, wanted me to, to take the whole thing over. So um, I did that, and um, that's been uh, not a very popular uh, thing that I did uh, with my wife right from the beginning, although she's come to live with it and uh, in part has made her own great career, but we both wanted to go back to New Zealand. When she came here, I, um, the arrangement was she was coming here for five years and uh, now we're 40 years uh, some later. So things happen and you have to make hard decisions sometimes and we, we were both okay with that eventually but it, it took some real work and thought as to just what we were gonna do. So I, I was asked to step up and I did and uh, we had a team of course of talented car investigators and we finished off the publication series from that first study and um, then when I was in Cambridge a few years later, uh, you know, Cambridge is a place that you uh, expected to have big thoughts. 
And uh, so I was thinking, well, that's the first study in California. There were 34,000 people involved, and it had shown some interesting stuff, but it really wasn't big enough. And we really needed studies that had at least about 100,000 people. And yeah, we could do it in the US, but we'd have to go right across the country because even though there was many more than that Adventists, of course, not everyone's going to join up with your study and fill out a 50-page questionnaire and all these kind of things. So we had to be realistic. But uh, so well, we got to plan for that. And um, I, I realised also that this kind of research couldn't be done in New Zealand for a number of reasons. One is that the population was too small. Um, secondly, and I came to realise later, I had an honorary professor appointment at Auckland for a while and got to know some of the guys there and talk with them and talk about the possibility of doing some research, even such as kind of what I was doing. And I came to realise with a shock, actually, that the kind of research I was doing could not be done in New Zealand, not only because of the population constrictions, but you know I was talking about plant-based diets. Um, I was interested in dairy and whether it was good or bad, and I was uh, wondering whether a vegan diet or a lacto-over-vegetarian diet or a non-vegetarian diet was good. And um, you know it's a political reality that funding for this kind of research simply is not possible back there. And uh, it took a little while for some of my colleagues back there to talk about that, but uh, eventually they did. So we stayed in California, and uh, part of the arrangement that I've uh, had with the family is that um, around that time we also purchased a uh, piece of land uh, in Matarangi on the Coromandel, and uh, we did it in 2001, and the exchange rate at that time was 46 cents. So, you know, you've got to pick your moment. But uh, we were very lucky in that respect. And it does seem a little extreme sometimes to uh, journey 7,000 miles to your beach house, but uh, we, we do that with some regularity. And it's worked for us. Um, crossing the Pacific, we no longer enjoy. So another, another point that uh, I would make is that sometimes it pays to stay here, and some of you are probably realising that. And that, but there are compensations and uh, to make use of those and maybe take some of your skills back home as many of you are doing and that's great to hear about. So I was preparing for this national study and trying to think about getting funding for it. As part of what one often does, we invited a team of experts, half a dozen people from around the country. Some of them I'd known personally, some of them I didn't just by reputation. We paid for them to come to Lower Melinda, we gave them an honorarium for a couple of days to hear of our plans and to you know, help us. Well, they reflected and they listened. Um, but at the end of the day, they were underwhelmed with what we planned to do and even cut short the meeting by half a day so they could all fly home to the East Coast and so forth. And um, that was a pretty disappointing kind of experience. Uh, they thought that with what we planned, there wouldn't be much chance of funding. Um, but to me, it still seemed a really good idea. You couldn't do anything quite like this with such a population anywhere else in the world. And so... After a while, we kind of reflected on what we'd heard. We tried to listen carefully. Uh, we changed little bits that we thought we could and what to do. Um, well, we put together a grant application, despite it all, and submitted it to NIH. And it was for a lot of money. Um, and we didn't succeed that first time around, but we got real positive comments and feedback and some suggestions on what to do that made sense. And so we put it together again about a year later. And this time we succeeded. And so I came away with um, about $11 million uh, for the research to be spent over five years. And another $6 million, year, $6 million went to the university. So you suddenly become very popular with the deans and the administration when you get a big grant like this. By the way, this doesn't happen in New Zealand. It's a different kind of system. But here you get these big overheads uh, from these grants. And so um, what did I learn? If you have a good idea, don't give it up too easily, but 
listen hard to others. They usually have some good additional suggestions. And reevaluate and be realistic. And if it still seems good, be stubborn. And uh, I think that's always worth doing. And so the Adventist Health Study 2 cohort came to pass, and we managed to enrol 96,000 people actually from every state in the country. We opened it up in Canada as well, so we got a few Eskimos and people from Labrador and all around. It's a very all-encompassing, fairly representative kind of cohort, all kinds of works of life, all socioeconomic statuses. Now, they're all Adventists, but, you know, in this country, that's not so weird. This is a country filled with religious people, isn't it? And um, uh, Adventists are just a Protestant group that uh, has many similarities to others. So um, I'm just going to finish here with a few results from our work that you uh, might find interesting. So let's see if we can move the slides on. And I think I've got a, um, actually, this is a little confusing. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> so this is the logo we used for our study, uh, which I think was quite neat. Uh, better health for everyone. Join in the discovery. We're trying to uh, persuade people to join our study and fill out that big questionnaire and a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> And that we had a, a number of technical innovations that were built into this. It was technically, it's quite a strong study. We had sub-studies that looked very carefully at the validity of our dietary information and were able to make adjustments for measurement errors and so forth. And um, I'm just going to show you four or five slides now, which are... Uh, some of the work, um, and of course we've had many, many pu publications that I could bore you for hours, but I won't do that. And this has to do with the question of our um, Adventist population actually in California being part of what came to be called a blue zone. Um, I need to keep my eye on the time here. Uh, so a blue zone is a, uh, an area of the world that supposedly has extra long-lived people. It came actually, what I call it a blue zone, it started off in Sardinia. There were a group of academics around a table and they had identified a little area in the island that appeared to have a bunch of centenarians. And someone got up and with a blue pencil and drew a circle around it. That's why these are called blue zones. But um, supposedly Loma Linda is one of those. That's not really true. The data that supports that was from Adventists throughout the state of California. And we now uh, got a paper in press that will show that to be the case uh, throughout the country as well. And what this shows us here, if you can see my little spot, unfortunately only on this side, that if you look at the lower three lines here and look at the percentage of males surviving to 85 years of age, and you can see the California Adventist men, about 41% of them were surviving to 85, whereas in the United States as a whole, it was about half that number. And if you look at the vegetarian Adventist men, it was nearly 50%. And here are the numbers for women, about 60% of the vegetarians, 54%, but in the United States as a whole, about 40%. So these were based on thousands and thousands of deaths. It's not an artifact of, or a chance finding. It's something real that's going on. You might argue about just what it is that's going on, um, but something is going on here that's uh, very important. And in fact, um, not to get too technical, but this is a survival curve. If you're using a life table approach, if you start off with a bunch of people all alive at the age of 30 years and follow out the deaths, this shows the percentage surviving at every year of age. And you can see the Adventist Health Study population, this is for the men, the whole curve has shifted to the right. And you'll notice here, up at age about 100, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two groups. But what is happening is here is the Adventists are saving on premature deaths uh, for interesting reasons. So the Adventists are doing better. The question is why? And there are a number of pop, uh, possibilities. One is they're all a religious group. 
the other is that, as I've mentioned, uh, these people tend to eat differently. And even the non-vegetarians are relatively low meat. But we can nevertheless make some comparisons only within the Adventists themselves. And so this is actually a strong study design. It's not like we're comparing Adventists to non-Adventists here, although we were a minute ago, because there's likely to be a bunch of other differences apart from diet when you do that. But here we're comparing Adventists to Adventists, who the main difference is that they eat differently. And uh, I've tried to get the colours right here. It didn't happen quite in this slide. It does down there. The uh, vegans are green for plants and the yellow for lacto over vegetarians, the blue for pescos eat a few fish, kind of orange for people that have a little blood, and that should be dark red for the non-vegetarians, so it turned out blue. Um, so you can see when you look at body weight, oh, I'm sorry, you warned me this would happen. Um, when you look at body weight for an average size woman and an average height man, that the body weight steps up like a ladder. And these are all Adventists, these are, but Adventists who choose to eat and live differently. If you look at the proportion who are currently treated for hypertension, there's also this rather remarkable progression. The proportion treated with diabetes and the proportion treated for high blood cholesterol. So I always get a bit antsy when I start showing these slides, particularly to a, a group of um, New Zealanders. And as I pointed up up the top there, it's a bit of a heresy, isn't it, for Kiwis to prefer plants? Although I hear that over the last year or so, about half the country's become vegans and they're camping out in front of supermarkets and all kinds of things. So, you know, there's hope, I guess. A couple of years ago, we were in Berlin. There are 31 vegan restaurants in Berlin now. Uh, and I'm not a particular advocate for veganism, by the way. Um, our data suggests that there's about equal benefit for lacto ovo that allows some dairy as well as a purely plant-based diet, but that's a discussion for another time. One of the things that we also asked, well, what could it be about a vegetarian diet? And you might say, well, it's the meat. Well, it's not so clear. And probably meat does have something to do with it, but probably a relatively small part of the effect. Rather, it's what, and more so, it's what the vegetarians replace the meat with. And that's where people often get confused. And it turns out that it's the, um, the plants of various sorts and, and the nuts and the legumes and, and uh, whatnot that they replace the meat with as a source of protein that appears to be even more important than the absence of meat itself. But it changes a little bit with different endpoints that you're looking at. Certain other cancers and heart disease and other causes of death might have slightly different relationships. Um, and so we looked at nuts a number of years ago, and at that time when we looked at it, um, most nutritionists were saying, well, you know, these are foods to avoid if you have heart trouble or take them very cautiously because they're full of fat and all these kind of things. Well, it turned out that uh, fats are not the same. Saturated fats and trans fats are certainly bad guys. The monounsaturates and the polyunsaturates, sure, they've got a lot of calories, but they don't seem to do bad things for arteries, and that's important. And so we actually were the first study to show that you lost the mic. Oh, no, there we go. Low nut consumers to high nut consumers, the risk of heart attack goes way down. And this is a men and that's a woman. And we actually cut the population about 18 different ways and looked at nut consumption. And we found that every time we looked at it, the high nut consumers, and this, you know, this is not sitting in front of the TV with a bucket of nuts. It's, um, it's kind of a small handful a day that, that it really makes a difference, it appears to be the case. And now, other, many other studies have uh, verified this. It's now part of the uh, mantra of the American Heart Association and some uh, other uh, institutions uh, to show the same. This is my last slide, and I don't know that our Consul General is still here, but... I, yeah, right. So I very carefully didn't bring my passport because I was worried he might snatch it after seeing this slide, but um, um, this is about to be published, and it's uh, information uh, that is kind of interesting. Now, admittedly, this is an observational study, but for dietary research, that's what you're kind of stuck with, particularly when looking at cancers. And here we're looking at breast cancer risk. 
and I've labelled this one Fonterra's Nightmare. Um, because what our data seems to show, and let me be clear, one study doesn't prove something, but this data looks actually pretty strong uh, when you look at it, that if you compare people who drink no milk, and I'm not looking at all dairy here, we did look at other dairy products, but this is milk, those that drink none, that the risk of breast cancer, and let's look at that solid line, goes up pretty steadily at even relatively small amounts of milk on a regular basis. This is per day. Now, I have nothing against milk. I've uh, been a consumer of dairy. I'm, a, I'm largely a vegetarian, but I've been a consumer of dairy. Don't particularly like milk because I don't know whether you guys had the same, but we were forced to drink half a pint of milk a day in school for many years, which never sat well with me. But um, but you know, this, this uh, data is very unlikely to be due to chance. Something is going on here. We've got to say that it's either causal or milk is strongly associated with something else that's causal, but we've adjusted for a whole slew of other risk factors for breast cancer here, and it doesn't go away. And one thing that's interesting in the United States, and I assume it's true in New Zealand as well, roughly, is that by definition, of course, all the dairy cows are lactating, and about 75% of them in this country at least are pregnant. Um, so it turns out that there are sex hormones that leach into the milk, sex steroids. Um, and it's interesting, we're finding pretty much the same kind of relationship with prostate cancer. And these are the only two cancers that are sex steroid dependent. So there could be something important going on here. And I think there'll be ways forward for Fonterra and so forth if this does pan out. But um, it's going to be interesting to see the reaction to this. So... Um, I think I'll uh, leave it there for some questions. Good, maybe, if there's time. <laughs> so that was so good that I just couldn't stop you. <laughs> it was, um, and with that last slide, it's phenomenal that you brought it up as well. We really don't have a lot of time for questions. We actually have some negative time for questions. But I... <laughs> But I would like to just say if there is one burning question that somebody has to ask Dr. Fraser now, then please raise your hand right now. Yes. Would you suggest a vegan or a meat diet overall? Oh, but that's a very easy question to answer. It's a much harder question to answer a vegan or a lacto over vegetarian. But um, our evidence is if you look at total mortality, uh, the vegetarians as a group have about 15% less mortality than the non-vegetarian Adventists. And remember, these are low meat Adventists. The paper we're just about to publish compares experience of Adventists across this country to a US census population of non-Adventists. And there we're finding about a 30 to 35% decrease risk of total mortality. Now the story gets a little bit more complicated if you look at particular cancers or cardiovascular disease. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't single out vegans particularly, but vegetarians as a group, yeah, no question. And it turns out actually the PESCO seem to be doing about best of all. <laughs> Yes. Where I'm, I'm a chef. All right. So normally, yeah. you know, mm. if I went to a restaurant to order a steak, I'd say, rip up the horns, slap his ass, and walk it across the grill. <laughs> yeah. uh, and serve it blue. Blue. Blue okay. is the way I prefer it. So, but, you know, I find that you have much more nutrients in the meat, it, the rarer that it is, opposed yeah. to being cooked like shoe leather. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, again, uh, we, we didn't look at that closely. We have some data on the degree of doneness of a meat, and there's some hypotheses, as you know, particularly relating to colon cancer, that there are carcinogens that can be produced if you cook the meat too much. Uh, if you don't cook it enough, I'm not aware of any particular downsides there, although there may be. So I, I, I don't think that I can give you a strong answer in that regard, except that the literature as a whole, jumping outside of our work, um, doesn't seem to show a huge amount of differ difference in the doneness of the meat for, uh, for health risk. Yeah. 
I'll be your pardon? That'll be the next study. And I think that that actually does pertain to really everything, that there are so many questions around this area. And I think that it's not often that you can say this, but um, Dr. Fraser and his team, because it's never a single person effort, have done more to giving us an evidence-based approach to what health is than anybody else. And now, thank you, this is really coming, not just in New Zealand and not just in the United States, but um, one of the things I have the privilege of being is the director of the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance. And now in 42 countries, we have physicians who are trained or training in lifestyle medicine and who are working on a lot of um, based basing their work on a lot of the work which Dr. Fraser and his team have done. It is amazing what you have done. And secondarily, it's amazing that you can break it down so that um, us average Joes can also understand it. So join me again for thanking Dr. Fraser. <laughs>